Okay, yeah, you hadn't started the webinar, so I thought people couldn't come in until you did that. Oh, I, okay. I didn't do I, it. I just, I just no, broadcast it, so I'm moving people now. Oh, okay, good. Well, I was wondering why there weren't. <laughs> All right, there we go. <laughs> Joey, we should start on time in the future. Oh, I thought you said a couple of minutes, sorry. Okay, I'm moving. <laughs> yeah, I mean, let people in. Okay. All right, wow, well, now we have a, oh, great. Okay, welcome everybody um, to the fifth of our, uh, out of six uh, seminars in our series. And uh, today we have Emily uh, Breza from Harvard talking about affirmative action uh, in India. I uh, just want to remind people the last seminar in the series is a week from tomorrow. So, uh, well, it's Wednesday morning in Hong Kong. <laughs> and so just uh, uh, make note that it's a change from the original time. Um, and that'll be Marcel Fashon, and we're very much looking forward to that talk as well. Okay, Emily, it's all yours. Great. Um, thank you so much for having me and thanks for staying up late with me for those of you in Hong Kong um, and in Asia. Um, my talk is about affirmative action, specifically reser political reservation in, for local government in India and its effects on social networks. Um, this is joint work with Arun Chandrasekhar and, and Amar Sharan. I think Sharan is, uh, was planning to join us so he can help field the tough question uh, from you guys. Also, please interrupt me. I'm, uh, I apologize in advance if I miss any hands. And so, um, Albert, please you know, feel free to interrupt me if I'm, if I'm missing somebody. Okay. okay, so just to, to motivate this, we typically care a lot about social economic inequality, um, especially with historically advantaged vis-a-vis -vis disadvantaged groups. Um, there are direct resource asymmetries that persist today and deep-seated structural problems. And clearly affirmative action is one of the policy tools that we have to try to combat this type of, of inequality. But the thing that we're interested in in this project is that large transfers of resources and potential shifts in social norms may also trigger changes in the socioeconomic landscape with, between you know, relationships among people in a network. Um, and those relationships are quite important in numerous domains. So social networks facilitate social learning, you can learn about new technologies, job referrals are very crucial, um, public uh, transfer schemes, healthcare, and the list goes on and on. And moreover, in places with poor formal institutions, social networks serve as a substitute to provide things like informal insurance and public goods. So if there is a shift in the social network because of affirmative action type policies, there may be some important downstream consequences that we might need to keep in mind um, and potentially even design our affirmative action policies around. Okay. So uh, just to give you a little bit about how we are kind of coming at this problem and thinking about how affirmative action and governance might change the network. Well, we think there are two um, predominant types of changes that might happen. First of all, if person I is deciding to link to person J, there may be a change in the instrumental value in linking. So it might be that um, person J now provides less or more value in terms of telling me about resources or being able to hook me up with a a public uh, transfer scheme, et cetera, or information. So perhaps when my community, if I'm in the historically disadvantaged group has direct access to power, I actually don't need links to the other community because now I can get that information directly from the source. Uh, there might be changes also in perception of those benefits um, if beliefs about ability or trust change. We, we've seen it, especially in the case of gender, um, that elevating women to leadership positions changes the community's perception of the ability of women to lead. And so there might be something like that going on here. Um, it also might be the case that there's a social perspective that changes uh, about I decision to link to J. Uh, norms in the community might change. It might be that it's not right. Uh, it's deemed that it's not right for a person I to interact with person J. Um, for example, when it comes to food preparation, friendship, marriage. Um, there might be beliefs on the quality of inter interaction, person I might find person J more unpleasant or worthy. Um, and there also might be changes to beliefs on process, right? The caste might become more salient in our particular situation. Um, or I might uh, now think, wait, I've been you know, treated unfairly because of, of J. 
So for all of these reasons, and I'm not gonna ever claim that we're gonna really be able to home in on exactly which pieces there are, but I'm gonna try to show you some evidence um, to navigate these. Uh, but all of these things would push toward um, social networks potentially changing in response to affirmative action. Um, and then, you know, that's important because the, you know, if, if those interactions and interaction norms change, that implies downstream outcomes that we care about, you know, uh, for themselves by, uh, alone, social learning, informal insurance, and actual resource allocations. Okay. Um, so what we're going to do here is study political reservation for, for um, scheduled castes, historically disadvantaged caste groups in India. And there's been a very large literature on this. We're, not, we're definitely not the first um, to, to come at this. There's a large literature in both economics and, and political science. Um, some of the research argues that political reservation improves resources to lower caste communities, um, especially public goods. Uh, especially in the case of gender, which is not what we're studying, but it's very similar. Um, stereotypes improve, as I mentioned before. Um, also, there's some evidence that uh, aspirations improve uh, in the long run in communities that ha have had longer access to, to these types of policies versus not at all. Um, so, you know, those, th those things are all, all interesting, especially I think resource transfer is one of the primary goals of these policies. But the world is more complex. And if we have these kinds of instrumental incentives to link, as I mentioned on the previous slide, then we might actually get fractionalization in, in the network. Um, it's also the case that we, we know already that changes in interaction patterns on one dimension multi matter through multiple domains. Um, so for example, if I want to go, if, if I'm in a borrowing relationship with a person, when I'm having that conversation about repaying my debt, I might also ask for advice, or I might also learn gossip about the village. These things are, are all layered on top of each other. Um, and again, as I've said, these network changes can have further downstream effects. And finally, you know, we're, we're not gonna have much to say about this, but uh, if we do find that these types of policies, you know, despite the, trans, the improvements in resource transfer, uh, nonetheless lead to fractionalization, that raises an interesting policy design program. How about how to extract those resource benefits while at the same time guarding against threats of fractionalization. Okay, so uh, to take all of that uh, motivation and put it into something more concrete, our concrete research questions are as follows. First, how does affirmative action and governance affect the social network? Does it change interactions? Does it change the norms of interactions in, in these communities? Um, and then does it increase or decrease homophily, which is our measure of fractionalization? Then second, do these changes correspond to changes in information flow? If we see increased fractionalization, then we might expect information to flow less well. So when new information is introduced to the network, how does it spread? Um, and then, you know, had network structure effects notwithstanding, how does it impact resources? So going back to these other papers, do we see something similar on the uh, on overall, you know, success of public transfer programs and who's getting those resources? Um, and then you know, how can, if we do find these impacts and we are gonna find these impacts, how do we parse them? How are social perspectives changed, if at all? Are there improved or worsened stereotypes? Is there animus toward the uh, group that's benefiting from the reservation? Uh, does civic and political engagement change? Is this something about the political process that's changing the network? Um, and are there corresponding positive or negative aspirational changes to, to kind of match this to some of the previous literature? Okay. So just to give a, a very quick overview of what we find, we do find that the network structure becomes more fractionalized. There's not much of an overall level impact in link patterns, but there's a big compositional shift, especially uh, when we're just, we're talking to lower caste. I'm gonna use LC and UC as our shorthand for, for lower caste and upper caste. So the LC to LC link rate increases by 16% and the LC to UC link rate decreases by 40%. Um, and so that already hints at some sort of uh, fractionalization. Along with the shift in networks, we find that the appropriateness of cross-caste interactions um, as elicited in surveys declines by 0.15 standard deviations. And then all of that feeds into an increase in fractionalization. Um, and, 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 and what I guess our headline number there is a 23% increase in, in homophily. We also find that in, in uh, yes, Sue Jetta? Yeah, um, so you didn't mention, well, are these sort of bi-directional links that you're thinking about? 
Yeah, that's a good question. So everything we're asking is, um, do you go to or someone comes to you? Everything is kind of, it's not, it's not directional. Um, and everything, and I'm just going to assume a symmetric network. Now that we have some hints in our data already that maybe um, these things aren't that symmetric. And so one of our things on our to-do list is to try to, you know, uh, consider what, what we would find with um, uh, some machinery that allows there to be a little bit more directionality. So the questions that we're asking, as I'll show you in a few slides, are um, who do you go to or who comes to you for advice? Who do you go to or who comes to you for borrowing? And who do you go to or who comes to you to socialize, you know, do, you know, watch TV together, play cards, et cetera. So the way we're asking about a network should be completely symmetric. But as you'll see, we're, we see a lot of action on LCs and, and how they answer these questions. And we don't see much action at all on UCs in terms of how they answer these questions. Um, OK, so so I, I would, you know, this is still quite abstract, but I'm imagining a situation where um, you know, there are probably government benefits and things like that, that you get access to, or, or you become in charge of if you are um, elected, right? And so then if, if it's reserved for a particular cost, then suddenly a low cost person has the ability to decide who the beneficiaries are going to be for a public program. If that's the world we're thinking of, then you would imagine that UCs don't need these public programs and so that's probably why you're not creating new LC to UC links when an LC person becomes a representative. That's right. I do think the incentives of linking are asymmetric. Um, the, the, and I'll, I'll talk about this. And let me actually just pause. I think in, in a few slides, I actually have um, something to say about that. I agree with you. I think that um, the addition of an LC uh, head of the, the local government is asymmetrically beneficial to the LC community and it doesn't it's not that detrimental to the UC community. Yeah, um, yeah. Another reason they might not need the programs but also they have other ways of having political power the vice president of the council is going to typically be UC. So mm -hmm. I, I do I do agree I think the benefits are asymmetric and we shouldn't expect these things to just cancel and, and we actually don't we find that they don't cancel. That's a good point. Um, so uh, we in in we fit we were sort of um, so I should mention, actually, I should mention this at the top. This is the first time I've presented this entire talk. So I'm extremely eager to, to get feedback. Um, we had run most of the surveys we wanted to run prior to the pandemic. We ended up having to, you know, call it and say our sample is our sample. Um, but then in to, to kind of think about resources and new information, we ran a set of phone surveys in April, um, you know, right in the middle of the lockdown and the new types of transfer policies going on for COVID. Um, and so we show that in that context, new information spreads more slowly in reserved places. Conversations about COVID declined by 25%. Um, the knowledge of frontline health workers and precautions, they declined for UCs, which would be consistent with the information not getting to the UCs. And this is a setting where the UCs should need to learn this stuff too. Um, and then we do find evidence consistent with the standard literature that there are improvements in resource access at the village level. Um, there's a 0.4 standard deviation increase in the receipt of COVID economic schemes. Now, there's not discretion here about who can get these policies, but you know the the leader might help in terms of helping you fill out the for, uh, forms, understand who's eligible, um, and just publicize that in the village. And we don't find any the LCs do benefit more, but we don't find any crowd out uh, for the for the uses. Uh, and then finally, on social perspectives, there's no detectable change in animus negligible changes in beliefs or stereotypes, we don't find what um, the gender literature has found. Uh, really, it's it's kind of a set of, of zeros across the board. Um, and then if anything, religious and cultural participation declines, but there's no change to political participation. So we don't think this is a, a story of just civic engagement. We think it's something else. Okay. So any other questions before I get into more of the details? If you raise your hand, um, sorry, it's just hard for me to see all of the um, hands going up. So please don't hesitate to stop me with questions. Okay. Okay, so our, our study, uh, we chose to, to, to do the study in Bihar, India. Um, the population of this one state is 110 million people, and it's like third, uh, one third of America packed into an area the size of Indiana. And it's one of India's poorest states. 
the caste hierarchy is quite salient in rural villages in Bihar. Um, there are, and I'm so so the the caste system is like is quite nuanced. I'm going to speak about it generally in broad brush um, in terms of like the upper caste or the high caste, which are the categories general and other backward castes, and then the low caste, which are the scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. Um, we decided to run our surveys in places that had low scheduled tribe populations. So really, the low caste, for all intents and purposes, in our setting, are the scheduled castes. So these are the traditionally um, uh, disadvantaged groups, the ones who uh, the, the untouchability norms would have applied to. And so the traditional hierarchy is the general group, um, then the OBCs that are not part of this so-called extremely backward caste, and then there's extremely backward caste OBC group, there's an SC group um, that's sort of higher and then the Mahadalits, which is the kind of more disadvantaged of the disadvantaged group. And then within each of these subcategories are many subcasts or jatis as well. Um, we have a lot of information about jatis that we haven't yet exploited that I think would be potentially helpful. Um, uh, and, and if you, anybody has any ideas, I'd be very happy to hear them. Um, the main minority caste group is the scheduled caste. It's 17% of the population. Um, and the, the, the gaps on economic outcomes are still quite large. So 37% of SCs in Bihar uh, live below the poverty line. It's 23% of non-SCs. 29% of SCs are literate compared to 51% of non-SCs or UCs. 9.1% of toilets versus 23% UCs. You can see these UC numbers aren't super high as well. Like this is quite a poor state in India, but these gaps are very, very large. And so this is the kind of um, motivation for wanting to be able to make sure resources are actually getting to this group since this is the group that needs them the most. Um, all of the affirmative action I'm talking about is in the context of the Gram Panchayat or GP. Um, and this is the local government body for rural areas. A GP uh, generally covers several villages um, and there are elected officials. So there are the GP heads. This is the person that uh, is reserved that I'm studying here. And then there are ward members. These ward members represent very small neighborhoods. And so they're typically representing caste homogenous constituencies. And so they will have heterogeneous caste. Okay, so in this reservation policy, the whole point of this is that in, in the status quo, because the SCs are a minority group and because they're disadvantaged, less than 1% of GP heads of, uh, were SCs. So you're really not getting any SC representation in the leadership of these, these councils in absence of this policy. And one of the goals, among others, it's you know, a very complex uh, set of issues, um, is to have represent representation of these disadvantaged groups and leadership as a tool to improve resource allocation, but also hopefully to trigger some of these other positive benefits that I talked about at the top that others have studied. Um, and in Bihar, so a lot of states began these sort types of reservation policies in 1995, um, but Bihar was late to the game, which helps us from you know, an econometric perspective. Um, they began the reservation only in 2006, and 17% of seats across the state for village council heads are so-called reserved for uh, members of these scheduled castes. There are other types of reservation policies that go along with it. There are reservations for, for gender, there are reservations for some of these OBC groups. We're going to particularly study the SC reservation. Um, so the reservation status of a Gram Panchayat is fixed for two election cycles. So you get a member of this, this disadvantaged group for 10 years. You might get a turnover in who gets elected from that group, but only people who are from one of the scheduled castes are allowed to stand for election. Um, and when the Gram Panchayat head is reserved, there's no change to ward representation. That's still very much local. That's caste heterogeneous. Um, and then the vice head is elected by ward members since only um, you know, under 20% of the population is SC. Uh, if it's a majority vote, the vice head is typically going to be a UC or an upper caste person. So that's another ch channel through which the UCs have to get information, to get resources. It's not like they're completely boxed out. They go from two people in leadership roles to one, uh, and the SCs go from zero to one when reservation comes to their village. Um, and you know, this is a controversial policy. It was contested and delayed 
Um, and so we'll talk about maybe how, how we should think about that in context in the context of our results at the end. Okay. Um, so another benefit of doing this in Bihar is that they actually followed an algorithm and um, my co-author Sharon uh, did all of the hard work and some previous uh, work with Chinmaya Kumar to sit down with the people who actually construct this algorithm to figure out what are the inputs, how is this run, and how can we use this for identification. So we're going to follow their strategy in constructing an, uh, a regression discontinuity design from this. They did this for the 2006 um, reservation algorithm. Since we went in and did surveys in, in 2019, um, we're studying the, in 2018, we're studying the 2016 rotation of reservation, but it's only going to be the second time uh, reservation changed in Bihar. And so there are still many places that have yet to have a reserved seat. And in, in other parts of India, everybody has had at least one uh, go at, at being reserved. Okay. Question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Imran has a question. Oh, Imran, please. Oh, hi, Sorry. Emily. Oh, so one, one thing I was thinking was that it, for the general problem of sort of changes in governance structure and how that's going to impact um, social networks, I, maybe, maybe this is too simplistic a way to think about it, but it seems like some of the fundamental comparative statics are to do with, you know, how contested this governance change was, the degree of inequality between um, those who uh, you know, clearly gaining and those who might be losing out, or to go back to Sajata's point, the extent to which we think of this as a zero sum game. So I'm just wondering whether you have any variation across the, uh, the, the villages here to try to look at some of those comparative statics and say, look, that, that you know, in, in a general class of governance changes, th those might be really fundamental to how we think about how social networks are going to respond. So here yeah. it seems as if this, it's not a zero sum game. There's a small change in political power for the UCs. Like you said, they're not crowded out completely. So in a sense, it's almost like the best case scenario. Um, and you could imagine other changes in government structure which would be far more extreme. Here, here the only bad thing is you, know, you have a lot of um, uh, controversy before the policy is implemented. But it was just thinking more in terms of those comparative studies, what you could do within sample. Yeah, I, I think the one, so I, I think those are all really good ideas. The one thing that we haven't done that's on our to-do list is to, look at specific relationships with the subcast that was in the incumbent prior to these policies with the idea that you know power is sticky and to see do we do we find that these effects are concentrated vis-a-vis -vis that group or is it something more broad-based i think that already helps to get at this a bit we can do a little bit more digging about um about how contested these things are uh, one thing we are trying to do um luckily for us this is the first project where we collected phone numbers for everybody in one of our survey modules. So it's quite easy for us to go back. Um, we're trying to get just overall perceptions of the policy. Um, we found in a small sample so far that about two thirds of people think this is a good policy in a, of UCs and about um, maybe a 40% uh, or to a third to 40% think it's a bad policy. And we could try to do more there. Unfortunately, we don't have any measures that were pre uh, 2016 on, on that. Um, but I agree with you, those are really interesting directions to push this, to think about those, those channels. Um, okay, so the, uh, and if you have any more ideas along those lines, I'd love to hear them because this is exactly the kind of thing we wanna try to work on in our next phase. Um, so let me first explain this algorithm and how it worked. It's actually quite simple once um, some of the, so the most complicated thing about it is how these different types of reservations were all balanced at the same time. Um, but beyond that, it's actually quite simple. So the, al the algorithm that was used to allocate reservation to Grand Panchayats had two steps. Um, now the, the way that um, the governance works, there's a district within a state is the, you know, the, the large type of administrative uh, group. Then there's a block, which is kind of a sub-district. Within the blocks, the, the Grump and Chites kind of, all of the Grump and Chites in the block sort of report up to the state government at the block level. So lots of stuff is done at the block level here. So in the first step of the allocation, um, the algorithm figures out within a block how many Grump and Chites get a uh, reservation. And there are typically 15 um, Grump and Chites per block. And this is just this just increases with LC share in the block. So places with more LCs get more reserved slots. 
Okay, so then within a block, and we're not going to say anything about that. We're going to just take that as, as given as exogenous. Within a block, the algorithm reserves which specific GPs get it, and the running variable is the number of SCs. Now, there are small deviations due to the priority ordering of other types of reservation that will have to take into account, but it, it was very, very well followed in, uh, in Bihar. Okay, and we're going to do the 2016 reservation. Okay, so here's just a very simple example. Um, the GPs are arranged in increasing order of SC population. So suppose you know these are the citizens, and the red people represent you know the their share of SCs. And so we have um, we have this in increasing order. Now suppose that this block has five GPs and it's allocated two reservation slots. Um, the first two get taken. And then there's, we call the threshold, um, the median in the SC population between kind of the last that gets it and the first that doesn't. So the first above is treated and the first below is, is kind of our control. So that's the easy case. So when the reservation algorithm looks like this within a block, we just pick and sample the treated and the control. And when I show you some RD plots, we're gonna set the running variable equal to zero um, and, and rescale it at the midpoint of um, control and treated for the SC population. The second scenario is a little bit trickier. Um, there might be a, 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 a GP that prior to the SC algorithm being run gets blocked to potentially get OBC reservation or no reservation at all. So we know that this one's ineligible unelig for anything so we're going to throw that guy out and we're going to do the thought experiment. Suppose that this block had been allocated one more SC reservation slot and the control observation is going to be that next GP in line that would have gotten it after the algorithm had run. So because in that thought experiment, this blocked OBC Gram Panchayat would never have been eligible, we skip it and we move on to this other, to this other observation. Okay, so when we do that, we basically have a sharp RD. Um, there's, um, you know, very little uh, in this 2016 round, um, you know, manipulation of this uh, around the cutoff uh, because of it was unpopular or what have you. I think in other states, this wasn't implemented nearly as well. Um, it would, you know, it took Bihar a long time to get their act together and, and actually turn out to have been, uh, everybody seemed to follow this algorithm. Uh, and so what we're doing in this project is um, sampling around this 2016 cutoff within block. So everything I show you is gonna have block fixed effects. Um, and again, the treated is the last GP reserved above the cutoff and the control is the next GP reserved if the block had been allocated one more reservation slot. Uh, and so the average difference in LC population across all of villages in that block is uh, about 75 households. And I think at the village level in our sample, it's about seven households different. So then um, within each selected Grump and Chayat, because a Grump and Chayat has many villages, we had to decide where to collect uh, data. So we picked two villages. Now, because we're doing network surveys, um, there are pretty uh, steep require, you know, the, the network gets much, much more complicated. It's like an N squared type object as population grows. So we restricted uh, village size. We didn't pick the very, very largest villages or the very smallest villages. So we threw out villages that were smaller than 400 households. Um, and we threw out villages that were, we picked villages that were smaller than 400 households and we threw out villages that were smaller than 80 households. Um, also, there needed to be a boundary of the village so that we knew we were surveying the right households and we weren't missing anybody. Um, and then moreover, for this to be an interesting project, we needed to make sure there was some caste heterogeneity within the village because some villages are purely SC. Um, and so then we had some requirements that it couldn't just be one SC household uh, in the village, for example. We needed to have at least 25. Okay, and so here's some, um, you know, we, we need to go back and, and do sort of McCrary tests since this is a, an RD interpretation, but this is just balance since we're sampling already in a small window around the discontinuity. Um, we're pretty well balanced on everything. Um, the one thing that depending on fixed effects sometimes is imbalanced is pro uh, proportion of households with a government job, but these differences in magnitude are just not very big. 
um, even, even if it's statistically different. So in terms of thinking about these villages, the total number of households is about you know, 230 to 250. Um, and then you know, about 75 of those households are SC households. Um, and then we collected this type of information to use in our um, aggregated relational data network elicitation, um, proportion of households with bikes, proportion of households with smartphones, um, educational attainment of the children in the household, government jobs, uh, casual migrants, steel gates as a measure of wealth, two floors, um, livestock, and a thatched roof. So these are these are these are all are balanced as well in our sample. Um, so this, we basically are going to use this as an RD. Um, our main estimating equation, we're going to take the outcome of interest for household I and village V of Grand Pantaya G and block B. Um, there's the, the key variable that we care about is whether they're reserved or not. So this is just whether their um, SC population is above that block specific threshold. And then we can control separately for functions of SC population above and below the discontinuity, and then also village level controls in our main regression, and then block fixed effects, given that this is a within block design. Okay, so um, since networks are our main outcome of interest, um, we're going to measure them a couple of different ways. Uh, at first, the first thing I'm going to show you is the most simple and straightforward to understand. These are the local network characteristics. So we're directly eliciting our respondents' local neighborhood. A, a node for our purposes is a household. And um, we asked them first to list their friends, and we defined exactly what we meant by a friend. Um, we said, name those households in the village with whom you do any of the following. A whose house you visit frequently or who visit your house frequently or with whom you socialize frequently. B, who gives you advice or to whom you give advice on agriculture, health, finance, finance. And then C, uh, finance, from whom you borrow or you borrow from. Um, and this can be money or items like kerosene or charcoal or rice, et cetera. It doesn't have to be financial. Uh, and so this sets up a symmetric um, undirected network and we're going to just take the or, which means if, if you, you know, we're going to just count a link as uh, a one zero binary uh, event if you have any type of these relationships across these many dimensions. We've started looking at the different types. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the advice one is the, the um, so typically they're highly, highly correlated. Uh, typically, if you do any of them, you probably are in the advice network, sort of the gossip network, uh, but we get very similar results when we start to cut this by network component. And that's similar to other projects that we've done um, in Indian uh, villages. Okay, Question. so then what we do. Mm -hmm. uh, so when we think of the network, I guess there are many different kinds of networks within villages. Uh, some are vertical, some are horizontal, some are economic, some are political, some are social. So there are so many different kinds of links that you could have selected. Uh, what, you know, I'm just trying to understand why did you select just these three? Right, yeah, I think we needed to trade off kind of the, um, you know, feasibility of actually eliciting this. And these are, we've sort of, these, these three, are the kind of components from the you know original Banerjee Duflo Jackson you know much much lo longer network surveys? I guess the one big thing we're missing there is is kin, um, and so we think these are the key components in those. We've been able to kind of look at them piece by piece on the three that that we selected here because we did have them check off of these three types of relationships. Which ones do you have? Um, so we do have the yeah. The thought, I guess that, but that given, was given that this is about governance and, you know, I guess some of the earlier discussion, mm -hmm. you know, you might want to approach people because now they are in power or you don't want to approach some people uh, that you used to because they are no longer in power. And it is often about seeking help from the government or, you know, trying to, uh, to cozy up to people who are powerful and so on. I mean, that's kind of a political those are vertical, political kind of, uh, you know, uh, relationships, which is not represented here. So I, I would have thought the first order 
one would have been that kind of, you know, pleading for political benefits. I see. Yeah, I think what we had more in mind was not the relationship with the government leader per se, but the relationships with everybody else. Um, and so in some sense, you know, since we didn't ask that, we might be missing a lot of the action, um, yet we still find something on these dimensions. We did also so ask- these are the, the informal relationships that may be affected by the, uh, uh, I guess that's what you mean. Uh, so you may have some kind of social insurance happening within the community or borrowing, for instance. Uh, so that, that's what you're look, kind of looking at the effects on other things that may be affected. Right, right. Yeah, I think what we're interested in is not necessarily the politics going on. We think it's very, very interesting and we need to you know, do more to understand it and get inside of it. But what we're interested in is, you know, whether there are impacts on these downstream outcomes exactly, like information flow about other types of things, you know, and, and these, the scope for cooperation, but those types of outcomes. And so I, that was kind of our motivation going in. Um, in some specific settings, we do have questions on who you go to if you need this, um, perceptions about the, um, the mukia, the, the heads themselves. Um, and again, what we can try to do is, again, I think some of this specific Jati level information might be helpful. Um, but yeah, so, so we are more interested in like the non-political types of outcomes that might be downstream, that might, you know, be the unintended consequences of these types of policies. And I think that's what we're, we're very well suited to measure here. But you have, do you have data on those other kinds of uh, conversations? As well. we, have, we have information on on conversations pertaining to COVID and um, you know who you go to for information and uh, you know trust in the in the Grand Panchayat that kind of thing. Um, I guess if we're going to go back, we can try to probe what we're missing by um, uh, not having these political types of of questions in there. I do think that you know. The some of the advice stuff we think might probably still pick up the the political stuff like where do I go to find information about you know policies about health um, and to the extent that the that the Grand Panchayat runs some of the these these organizations we think that's going to be embedded in the advice component. So it's going to be hard to separate that right I mean so yeah so this may include some of the the governance related conversations. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, 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 that's, and that's totally fine with us. Uh, but, um, you know, that's why we also wanted to look at information flow and resource allocation. Um, and we can separate these three dimensions. And we do see that, you know, um, as in the previous work, it's not just, it's not just that component that, that is, is responding. Uh, and I think okay. I'll show you, I th I'll show you information. I think the most powerful information that I'll show you that has nothing to do with politics is the norms of appropriateness of cross-cast interactions and untouchability, which, you know, doesn't, that's something that's kind of a separate, uh, separate beast. Uh, okay, Han? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it seems like uh, it's common that in this kind of network service, like people put a cap on the number of like res like friends they can nominate, right? So it seems like you don't have a restriction here. So how is that might no, impact the outcome? We, we instructed our, uh, so we think the cap is actually uh, not a great feature of some of the surveys because, you know, we do think that there are some people who have a huge number of, uh, of connections and it's important to pick that up. Um, so we instructed the surveyors to not put a cap on it. We said, look, you know, on average, you're not gonna have that many. Once in a while, you're gonna be sitting there for a really long time. And that's just the way it is. We're not gonna penalize you for, you know, being less productive yeah. on that day. Um, and there was some pushback in our piloting from the RAs and from the survey team. And we said, no, 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 this is really important that we actually try to get that, that fat tail of, of relationships. Yeah. So it seems like it can impact result in two ways. So why is like if people list a lot of like friends, then the density to some extent, like the now of density should be kind of lower because it's very hard to fill out this, you know, now is it address around the neighborhood. And the second way is like, since you like for each link reported, you ask them to report their friends like separatist, which is the report like a kind of friend as they get exhausted, like, they don't want to, you know, report either, you know, friend information. So I don't know whether you have encountered this kind of like too specific. 
<laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know what we can do on the survey fatigue. Um, I think, you know, in some of the stuff we have follow up questions about each person and to make sure that the survey fatigue didn't set in, we had them list the, all the names and then surprise them with the follow up questions per person yeah. to try to avoid that problem. But that's sort of the best we could do in the field. Okay. But I agree. It, it, it sort of it is what it is. Um, uh, yeah, we tried to keep the module pretty short. Um, we I'll show you exactly how we went and did this aside from you know, the, these network questions. Um, and so, so for each person, importantly, uh, on the list, we asked their subcast, and then we can map the subcast to their cast category, UC, LC, or, and LC, and I'm using LC and SC also interchangeably. I'm really sorry about that, the low cast and scheduled cast. Okay, so with this local network data, our key measure, our key outcome is, is density. Um, so, uh, it's total links, your personal degree divided by population. This is equivalent to a linking probability. Uh, and then, of course, because we know the specific cast and cast category, we can measure density by cast group. So conditional on the person, I could be either UC or LC. I can measure my links to LCs divided by the LC population. So what's my probability of linking to an arbitrary member of that group? So then we are also interested in sort of these more graph level measures, especially thinking about things like fractionalization. Um, and we, uh, direct elicitation is prohibitively expensive in that case. Uh, it's really hard to get whether I and J are linked for every single pair of I and J. Um, people have done it, but it requires sampling a very high fraction of households. It's very time consuming. The matching of the names people report to the census roster is quite cumbersome and costly. Um, and since we wanted to hit a large number of villages in this project, we decided to use aggregated relational data instead. This is something that Arun and I have worked on with the statistician Tyler McCormick um, from the University of Washington. Uh, and so what we did is we asked people, how many friends do you have of type T? So this could be like, has a tractor, government employee, two-story house, your cast group, et cetera. Um, and so in contrast to, you know, the listing all of the friends, this is quite easy to elicit. We actually just asked for every person on their friend list, do they have a bicycle, do they have a smartphone, do they have a government job, et cetera. Um, and so what we do in this other project is we develop a parametric model-based approach to use the aggregated relational data. So these kinds of, you know, they're just sort of different measures of types of degree to construct features of the network. And in that paper, we can replicate the finding of two other empirical papers, which actually had network data uh, with ARD alone, and it's, it's a lot less expensive. And we need about a 20, 25% sampling rate in the village to make sure that that works well, according to our simulations. So what we're gonna do in this model is we're, just, we're gonna, again, I said it's parametric. This is where all the you know bodies are buried, um, that the probability of linking uh, is going to be a function of, uh, for person I and person J, these news are your gregariousness, so some sort of fixed effect. And then the distance between these two people on some latent space. Um, so in the, this particular situation, we're gonna think about the latent space as being the surface of a sphere. Groups are scattered around the sphere. And so if I'm really far from you on this latent space in my trait space, then my probability of linking to you is much smaller. If we're much closer in the latent space, my probability of linking to you is higher. Um, so every node is gonna have a type. Uh, types are located on this latent space with some center. And then um, types are, are distributed uh, according to this von Mies Fischer distribution, which is like a normal distribution sitting on top of this ball. And you know, so some type groups are gonna be really tightly knit and some type groups are gonna be pretty dispersed that's going to matter. And then also the locations of different groups on this sphere. And what so I, could, could I ask some, some questions about, yeah. you know, this, uh, I mean, some of the problems I have with understanding this is, you know, when you ask someone, how many, you know, who's your friend? I mean, when we think of who my friends are, you know, it's not a zero one thing. It's, I, you know, I'm more friendly with some people and less friendly with some people. And when some surveyor comes to me and asks me, who are your friends? I mean, I, I make a quick reply and I, I don't know what, it, what the threshold is for friend. And I just say, okay, I think of my three best friends or something. Um, so, uh, 
that's one concern the other concern is that you know again this is about friendship and friendship is very different from other kinds of relationships so my you know who i borrow money from is probably not my friend uh, you know who i go to for favors from the government is not my friend those are vertical relationships so we can also think of links on many different dimensions so how do you end up with just a single measure of you know of these are the links uh, right. links of what and right. you know and how do you deal with the discrete versus continuum yeah. aspect I, I mean, I totally agree with you. There's this is the philosophical question about what the graph is. We have to take a stand on it to measure it. But I think you could use this adjacency matrix in a different way. You could also use this, and this is how we did it in some previous work. You could say that, you know, my the people I call my friend are people that I interact with at the highest probability, the friends of friends with a slightly lower probability, the friends of friends of friends, et cetera. So we don't have to, we're not thinking about this necessarily as like a pure effects model where only my friends can impact my behavior. That's not, we're not going to take that kind of view about what this adjacency matrix is giving us. Um, I use the word friend because it's kind of a convenient word. We actually never use that word in our data collection. Um, and then, you know, what we, we just needed to be very careful to telegraph exactly what we meant by a link. Um, and we picked those three dimensions and we asked people on those three dimensions, you know, who, uh, who they you know would do those things with or do do those things with and so we think it's a we do we do think it's important to be quite concrete in how you ask this question because if you say who do you know you get a very different list so i, I completely agree with you so we do think there's content here we think we, we can show that these different dimensions are, are highly correlated empirically we can also run our analysis given that we have three dimensions it's not 10 dimensions um uh, dimension by dimension and show that our results are also quite similar and that's the same that we've you know, we found that in previous work, given that, you know, if I, if I form a relationship for one reason, oftentimes it spills over into, into other domains as well. Um, so I, I think that's the best I can say, but I totally agree with you. Um, we need to be careful, and especially how we're using this thing structurally, given that there are a bunch of assumptions that are coming into this uh, with how we design this question. Okay, so um, this is from a different paper. I, we're still generating the latent space pictures for for this one. Um, so this is in urban areas where we our ARD traits were about, you know, has the person been arrested? Has the person remarried? Uh, has the household had twins? Does this household practice polygamy? But I just want to show you what comes out of this. So this is for one particular neighborhood in a, a big city. Um, you get estimates of where the traits are located on the sphere and how dispersed they are. And that's something we're actually going to use. And so what we're, we're going to be able to do the same thing for uh, each of these cast categories or subcategories as well. And we can understand is what the policy doing in the language of our model, is it making these communities further apart in the latent space? Is it making the dispersion change of where these uh, of these groups? Are they more inward looking versus spread out uh, through the community? Okay. So what ARD helps us do is triangulate the relative position of these types. So, um, and then given the latent space locations, we can also identify the parameters of that linking model that I specified up front. Once we have all of those parameters and locations, we can then draw um, networks that are consistent with that network formation model. And for each draw, we can calculate the network feature of interest and then average across all of our draws. So we get kind of expectations over any network statistic that we um, that we want. Okay. Um, in our surveys, I'm going to go through this uh, somewhat quickly so I can get to our results. We did a census of 100% of respondents. We did the social networks module with a 25% random sample to try to you know accommodate our the needs of ARD. And then we asked um, the beliefs and resource module to a subset of those people. And then we did a phase two uh, post COVID after our main survey had to be stopped because all of this was in person. Um, and this was done on the phone to kind of understand information flow, who's getting the, the programs that Bihar's launched. Uh, because what they did is they deployed all of their social transfer systems to have new policies flowing on them, but you still needed to fill out some paperwork and understand your eligibility for those transfers to turn on. So they were using the um, public distribution system to increase people's uh, grain ration, there were cash transfers for women, um, widows, uh, people on their pension system, et cetera. 
Okay, and then the COVID survey, following all of our conversations with them, we told them all of the true answers to all of our questions to make sure that we were delivering the correct information, not just extracting something from the community. Imran. So I mean, this is a bit unfair, but I mean, just to follow on from um, from Dilip's question. So whenever we study networks, we're all, almost always doing that in partial equilibrium for the reason that uh, Dilip was saying. We know that networks matter in many different dimensions. So here, given that you're not sort of looking at political networks directly, it's very hard even to interpret an increase in homophily on one dimension without knowing whether that dimension of networks is complementary or, or a substitute for other dimensions of, uh, of, of networks. But I, I think what I can show you is real outcomes that match our measures of homophily to kind of show you that there is some, there is an actual impact in the village. Moreover, the norms of interaction change. And so these things are kind of easier to interpret absent the assumptions that we're putting into our, our network elicitation. So that's what I was going to come to. You have this other module on, on beliefs, sort of, and, and sort of um, beliefs with with regards to in groups and out groups, mm -hmm. and understanding sort of the, the you know the distribution of those beliefs and whether you get polarization or uh, you know homogenization of those beliefs seems to be like really re something very nice you could do here. I'm still struggling to see what the network's information gives you over and above what we would see from see from just looking at the beliefs module itself, given that we're only observing networks in partial equilibrium. Oh, I don't know. What do you mean networks and partial equilibrium? I think so if, we, if we're seeing an increase, say, in homophily in uh, resource sharing or informal um, transfers between households, it's hard for me to know whether that's welfare improving or reducing without having an understanding of whether that's crowding in or crowding out other aspects of social networks. Right. Um, right. It's, it's, it's very hard to draw sort of welfare implications from just looking at it through one dimension, whereas the, the beliefs module is very clean and clear. In, in a sense, it's a unidimensional measure of whether there's more or less tension or polarization within these communities as a result of this intervention. I think what you're going to see is it's not unidimensional at all. Um, we find some quite stark uh, evidence in some dimensions and none at all in others. So I think for us, the, the fact that the actual relationships, the advice, the people I'm going to for advice, which is clearly tied to this political problem, the people I'm sharing resources with, that is changing. Um, and then along with it, we're seeing all of these other changes. So I think it's hard to understand any piece of it without understanding the other ones. Because I think part of what might be happening is I'm not interacting as much with people who don't look like me, that in itself could be driving some of these norm changes. So I think so it's important. Whether you're mm -hmm. gonna look at an interaction between the two, whether sort of the response in beliefs partly depends on your network characteristics at baseline. So we don't, uh, so we only did surveys in 2018 and 2019. We don't have any measure of the baseline. I guess the things that we do know are like the, the cast composition. So we could do some sort of machine learning thing with our control group, um, uh, but we don't right now have any sort of baseline network measures. We have a, a post um, and we sort of believe, we, we kind of view this more as like a general equilibrium thing in that lots and lots of things could potentially be changing all at once. You know, all of those forces are pushing on beliefs, norms, network relationships. To understand any of it, we kind of need to look at all of it together. So I think that's kind of our view. And I, I you know, I do want to push back a little bit about not capturing any of the political stuff. Like, I think a lot of the information flow is clearly tied to this. I need, I ask advice for, you know, how do I get the, get a job? How do I, and Norega is something that is done through um, through the, 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 the panchayats. How do I get access to this policy? Who is our local health worker? That's also something that's tied to the government. So I think, I think that dimension, which is a very, you know, it is quite powerful in picking up those types of, of features. We're not, we don't have the clientelistic networks, that's right. Um, but short of that, I do think that our, our measures are picking up a lot of, you know, these other aspects of it. Um, and I think we can try to look at other things, especially the specific jockeys that would have been in power in absence of this to try to inform us of what's going on there. Okay, so let me let me speed up a bit. Um, so this is our our local pattern. So density in terms of the you know the rate of linking in each village. Um, we see a little bit of an increase for LCs, nothing for UCs. Um, uh, so the specifications the Column one, I'm going to show you three more, two more sets of these is the whole village. Column two is just restricting to LCs. Column three is just restricting to UCs. Um, again, not much is going on. Uh, this is links to LCs. So overall, links to LCs go up 
in the community. This is all driven by LC to LC links and no change in UC to LC links. Um, and then in terms of links to UCs, there's no change overall, but LC to UC links drop a lot. This is a 40% decline and UC to UC links don't change. So overall, we, the UCs aren't really mentioning much going on with their networks. The LCs are telling us that a lot is going on. They're recentering on their on other LCs and they're dropping a good chunk of their UC links. Okay. Um, norms of interaction. So our question, our questions here: Do community norms governing cross-group interactions change along with these network relationships? The causality could go either direction. Um, and historically, you know, we're asking things that are kind of tied to the well understood prescriptions pertaining to physical contact, food preparation, and touchability. We're not asking things about marriage because those are already, you know, there aren't very many cross caste marriages in these communities to begin with. Um, so the things that we're asking about are what percent of people in your caste would accept each of the following a UC person eating at an LC home, an LC person eating at a UC person's home, a UC person hugging or shaking hands with an LC person. And then what percent of people in your village practice untouchability? So on an index, all of these norms have deteriorated. So across all of these different dimensions, these norms have strengthened about it being unacceptable for, for these cross caste types of interactions. Um, we see, uh, and we see it coming from both the UC and LC respondents on, on different pieces. Um, so it's deemed to be more inappropriate for UC to eat at the LC's house. Not much is going on for LC eating at a UC person's house. The physical contact is less appropriate and untouchability practice, at least um, as you know, specified by the UCs has gone up. And so these norms of interaction have broken down, uh, which is a different way to kind of say the same thing. If pe people, aren't, people aren't interacting as much cross, as cross cast and the norms are also you know, less encouraging of that type of interaction. Okay, um, we're, next we can look at the um, global network structure. Um, so we have two questions that we can answer here. One, how does reservation impact the underlying parameters of the network formation model? And two, um, we can get a graph level measure of fractalization or homophily um, from this. So um, what we can, in terms of thinking about the components of the linking function, we can ask about um, the fixed effects. So this is the unconditional linking effort. These are the gregariousness parameters. We can also ask about the dispersion of the locations of members of own caste. So holding fixed efforts, how likely is it that I encounter another member of my caste? And then distances from other caste. The change in the relative rate of linking given, given the unconditional linking effort. So how much have these groups moved apart? Um, sorry that this is blurry. We see that the uh, scheduled caste, which is the group that benefited from these reservations, or at least got you know power, um, they have higher uh, um, you know gregariousness after this. Their linking probabilities are higher, and it's mostly unchanged for others. And then on dispersion and distance, we see that the upper castes and the SCs are less dispersed. They move away from each other and toward themselves. And there's an increase between the um, the upper, the, the bridging cast, these, uh, the lower upper castes and all of the lower castes as well. So the, in addition to becoming more concentrated, some of these groups have moved further apart. Okay, our measure of homophily, we're gonna use consensus time. So this is gonna be a measure that's proportional to the number of periods in a social learning process until society reaches consensus. Um, and so more fractionalized homophilic networks will have longer consensus times. We think this is a convenient way to summarize the impact of change in the network on information flow. And so what this is, uh, is this going to be uh, log population divided by the second uh, eigenvalue of the stochastic uh, adjacency matrix. Um, so what we find is that in places with reservation, consensus time goes up by two communication rounds, so two days, let's say, uh, and the control mean is 8.6 days. So it takes the village on this measure 23% longer to come to consensus about uh, information in a social learning process. So the implication here is that if we indeed find, you know, we found that this is a in our measured constructed networks that uh, consensus time has gone up, 
the testable implication there is that information flows less well in the reserved uh, Gram panchayats, which we can actually look for. Okay. So what we can do um, is look at the COVID data, uh, the post-COVID surveys. Um, and you know, COVID-19 just meant that there was a ton of new information that needed to enter the system. Um, and so then if networks become more homophilic, do we actually see less information, less learning about all of this new stuff uh, related to, to COVID? So we can look at volumes of conversations um, and then also two dimensions of knowledge, health preserving behavior. So do they know the symptoms and the precautions? And then do they understand the health system? Do they, do they know who the point of contact is in the healthcare system to go to if you think you're symptomatic? And that's the ASHA worker in this particular case. Um, so what we see is that total conversations drop um, uh, and conversations with friends, which we think is the thing that measures, that, that matches to our surveys the best. This also drops um, about COVID. And then we can actually ask, you know, does it change people's knowledge? Well, the UCs are less well informed about the precautions you need to take. So masking, social distancing, hand washing um, uh, during these surveys. Uh, and when you average across LCs and UCs, we also have a negative. And so this is consistent with information not reaching, not bridging that gap from the LCs to the UCs um, in, in the communities. Uh, we find something similar for ASHA worker. This is the person again, who's managing the local health response. The villages- so, have, I, Emily, could I just, you know, just uh, slow yeah. you down a little bit because you're suddenly going very fast. And, very you know, yes. So just, just uh, the, previous, the previous one. Uh, so if information flow to the UC is decreased, uh, but you said that there wasn't that much impact on uh, UC LC conversations you know, earlier in the- Oh, there was, the there was. LCs to, LC to UC uh, relationships dropped by 40%. Yeah, but I guess I'm, I'm thinking uh, perhaps a, a reason was that, uh, that LCs needed to go to UCs because the Pradhan used to be a UC. Mm -hmm. So if you had to talk to any uh, the, the, the GP Pradhan, it was an LC UC conversation. That's now right. you ne didn't need to do it. It's it's all right. LC LC. Even though your what you're picking up is not, you know, governance related conversations necessarily. But maybe right. maybe it's there. Uh, but now, but the UCs are, is there evidence that the UCs are talking less to the LCs? The UCs uh, is that the interpretation that the UCs are not getting information from the GP Pradhan because you know they think it's beneath them to go and talk to a, an LC to, to, to get any information. So this, I, it's kind of a lack of symmetry as Sujata was arguing at the very beginning could be very important here. Right, right. No, no, I agree. I think that you know we do find that there's a big decrease in LC to UC relationships. If any information travels on those component on those relationships, then the UCs are going to, given that the LCs are the ones that have access to the head, um, the UCs are going to be more disadvantaged than, than the LCs because of the breakdown in, in the network relationships. Can I ask a more <laughs> general question about thinking yeah. about the harms to LCs in the broader context here? Because, you know, obviously they're now better connected and maybe information flows better to them because they're connecting and strengthening the LC links. So what of the kind of overall kind of uh, structure of these changes is actually harmful to the welfare of LCs? Yeah, so, so here, right, we don't have any impacts on them. Um, I think, you know, if untouchability practice, if you view that as, as harmful to the LCs or just kind of like, a, you know, going back to some of these interaction norms that maybe had loosened um, previously, uh, we don't think that's necessarily great for them, um, but that's right. So, you know, you might think about this uh, and, and I'm going to show you also, there are resource benefits to the LCs and that's coming up in a minute. Um, so I, I agree. And, and so can we, I think it'd be useful to have that conversation at the end. Once I also show you the beliefs information, like are, is there, are the beliefs changing in a negative way that might also be uh, consistent with that. So I think 
you know, the these norms of interaction, that's probably not great for the LCs themselves. Um, but uh, they're not losing out on this information in the COVID, the COVID stuff. The UCs are the ones that are really losing out uh, relative to the status quo. Okay, so resource access. Um, so again, one common goal of reservation policies is to ensure more equitable distribution of resources. So what we're going to ask is, did these new COVID policies that the government of Bihar switched on, did they reach the LCs better um, when there's reservation? So we asked three types of questions. Do you know of the scheme? We didn't move the needle on that. Are you eligible for the scheme? What this means is do you have all the paperwork lined up? Do you know what you need to do to be eligible? And you know, so, so that that it wasn't just like, are you a widow? Yes or no, that kind of thing. And then did the scheme benefit actually flow? And so on both of the eligibility and the scheme benefit receipt, we see positives um, at the village level. The bigger benefits are driven by the LCs, but we certainly don't find any evidence of crowd out for the UCs. So again, you know, reservation does improve resource allocation and because, you know, th it, this doesn't look like a zero sum game. It could be, you know, this isn't significant, but the fact that it's not negative might imply that there's some fixed cost for the village to kind of figure it out once the village is talking about it, the poorer UCs also are able to benefit as well. So there's no undercutting the resource allocation that we found in these types of policies. Okay, so I think there are three potential interpretations um, so far. Uh, the first is that SC representation just reduces the value of LCUC links. This is our, our, I think our preferred interpretation. And then the reduction in interactions is what kind of goes hand in hand with the change in norms. So kind of, we're not, we're not interacting already. And so then, you know, the norms of over interactions fall back into the, you know, sort of the standard uh, cast role norms from before. The other type of story could be that SC reservation generates resentment and backlash by UCs against LCs. Um, you know, this would be likely to cause worsening of the stereotypes and animus against LCs. And so we'll talk about stereotypes in a minute. This might cause worsen, this, the worsened beliefs and norms might be the first cause, which then impacts the interactions. So this would be causality running the other direction. And then the third one is that SC representation changes who participates in politics, that this disrupts the clientelistic networks or the SCs become more politically uh, active, the UCs recede and that alone, you know, the fact that I'm now engaging in politics changes who I'm interacting with. Um, and uh, so, so, or the UCs no longer need to court LCs for votes because they're not allowed to stand for the elections. Um, in that case, we would potentially expect a decrease in political participation of the LCs if they're not being activated uh, by the, the UCs to come to meetings and stuff. Okay, so we think that the driver of homophily here is important. Um, something that comes from two resentment and animus is gonna be much harder to diffuse or address than uh, the, the, um, the other ways around. So, you know, one could think about Inter, you know, creating scope for more cross cast interactions along with these policies if you're worried about the fractionalization in a world of number one or number three. In a world of number two, it's a much more intractable problem. Okay, so um, I think I wanna show you the, the stuff on stereotypes. So I think our prior was that we were gonna find something given that uh, the gender papers really found quite remarkable changes, um, but we don't find much on either dimension. So these questions are pertaining to beliefs about the UCs. So this might be, you know, we wouldn't necessarily expect much here. Um, what we asked is, you know, uh, questions about intelligence, trust, how likely they were to kind of steal or commit fraud, sort of shady behavior and how hardworking were they? And we made sure that the hardworking wasn't about physical labor, it was about, you know, you know other, other types of aspects uh, of hard work. Um, so uh, we don't really see much going on. One out of nine coefficients is um, marginally significant. So we don't wanna really overinterpret that. The LC's views on UC work ethic worsen, but nothing else changes. We're not, we don't think that is, is um, something that means much. Perhaps more importantly, these are the beliefs, the stereotypes about LC's. And we actually don't see um, much going on at all relative to the control means, these are quite small 
changes and very little is statistically significant. The only one that's significant is that LCs are less trusting of other LCs, which isn't kind of this direction of animus that the UCs now are angry and they think that they're you know, thieves or lazy or, or dumb or any of these types of things that you might conjure up if you have a situation of a lot of backlash and a lot of animus toward the other group. We just don't find any evidence of that kind of thing. Um, which is, again, a departure from the, the gender literature on the same thing. Okay. Uh, just two, two, two quick comments. One is yeah. that uh, I, I believe the, the Beeman et al. paper uh, on on what was about leaders and not necessarily about everybody in the village. And second, it took a long time for these stereotypes to change. So I guess in your case, you haven't had that much time that has elapsed because yeah. it's 2016, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Right. So, so, right. This is only a couple of years. So I think that I'm absolutely not ruling out the idea that these things might change in the longer run. I think that this does suggest though, that views uh, like these uh, views of animus toward that other group are likely not driving the um, the change that the very malleable change we see in network relationships and social norms. So I agree with you that if we had a longer period, um, this stuff might matter. Uh, this stuff might matter. Um, I, 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 I'm with you. Uh, so I think. Right. I, I also had a question about the persistence of the norm changes. Yep. I mean, it seems like you, you might be able to, I mean, the identification here is all cross-sectional, but you might be able to look at the previous um, leadership in the GPs yep. as a way to see, you know, when it's more unbroken um, or, you know, or, you know, if, if there's real persistence, then that's going to really inform, I think, uh, what you find in, yeah. in, in the current. So, so we, we collected period. some data from the 20, 2006 round. And the, what we're finding is pretty consistent with everything kind of switching off as soon as the policy switches off. Um, so I do think these are, I mean, these, these things are in place for 10 years, so it's quite a long time, but these dimensions are malleable. Um, and I think, again, that, that tells us it's not necessarily about these hate, it's about, not necessarily about hatred, it's about convenience. And, you know, I, I just don't need these, this group anymore, so I'm not gonna interact with them. So I think that also helps us uh, with that story that these, when the policy switches and the, the, the rotation happens, if I look at places um, that had it in the past, we don't see these types of impacts anymore. Uh, uh, although those are harder to interpret for a number of reasons. That's why I'm not showing them, but yes, I totally agree with you. Okay, so this is pilot stuff. So what we're trying to, we're trying to put some more uh, questions in the field. And so I'm, 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 I will definitely take the, the feedback I've gotten today and try to think about what else we can add to those surveys to, to address some of your concerns. Um, we asked people their views today on reservation policy. These are just uh, UCs. Again, this is a teeny tiny sample, but we get about, you know, 58% of people say this is a good policy. Um, the people who say it's a bad policy have very specific performance gripes with the, the, the head, this president uh, himself, rather than um, issues with, you know, the, the SC group in general. And so this would be consistent with the view that resentment's targeted toward the leadership people themselves and not broadly toward the community, which I think our previous results point to. Okay, um, so the last thing uh, I can, I have two more things. I know I'm, on, I'm out of time, but I'm basically done. Um, we have questions on religious, civic and political participation. So we do see, you know, it's these are all like not quite significant, but maybe, there's a decrease in religious and cultural participation, um, but we don't see much action on civic participation, which is the um, actual going, civic participation here means I'm going to the general assembly meetings for my village, the Gram Saba. Um, and then political participation is actually standing for election, joining a political party, et cetera. We don't see that margin changing at all. So we don't think those are mediating our results. And again, in the short run, again, like to Dilip's point, I'm not, you know, that we don't see any changes in aspirations. Again, this is only two years in. Other work that has kind of looked at much longer run uh, uh, access to these types of policies has shown aspir aspirational changes on education. So this is not something that's moving in the short run, although these network relationships and the social norms are quite malleable. So I'll, I'll, I'll end there. Um, let me just wrap up really quickly. Consistent with the goals of reservation, we do see the resource access increasing for LCs and there's no crowd out for UCs. 
However, the network does change. It becomes more fractionalized and norms governing cross cast interactions worsen and consistent with kind of the you know, predictions of homophily, we observe less learning. We don't think political participation is likely the chief mechanism or resentment or animus driving it. And so we do think that you know, the incentives for cross-group interaction are changing given who's in power. Um, and then the reduction of interaction is accompanied by a change in norms governing those interactions, kind of like the contact hypothesis work of, of Matlow, et cetera. So we do think that to the extent that we don't, we think fractionalization is a bad outcome, there are some you know, policies that could help mitigate that unintended consequence while maintaining these resource benefits. Um, so I really appreciate the questions. Again, this is the first time I've presented the, this in a, anything but a 20 minute um, format. And so this is all extremely helpful right now. Are, are there any burning questions from the audience or anyone? Otherwise, since I, I guess we are at time. So uh, thank you very much, Emily, very fascinating work. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank All you. Right. We'll close here.